Hi there, everybody. Renegade Historian back here with another Snippets of History. And today, I'm going to be covering one of the coolest battles you've probably never heard of. In the late 17th century, the Ottoman Empire was a superpower, on par with the likes of Spain, France, England, and Russia. But like many empires before it, the Ottomans overextended themselves, and history doesn't repeat itself, but it does often rhyme, and this was a tale as old as time. Forget girl meets boy, this was empire meets gold. The Ottomans' previous conquests had made them into one of the richest and most prosperous nations on earth, but every empire has a limit to how far it can reach, and for the Ottomans, it was a city far to the north of Constantinople. The city of Vienna was a bridge too far for the Turks. They had attempted to take it several times, but each time they failed completely. It's obvious why it was a prize. The conquest of the city would have opened both Germany and Poland to Ottoman attack. It was their gateway to further conquest in Europe. Not to mention, it would tighten the Ottomans' grip over all the rich trade routes that passed through the Balkan Peninsula. But Europe had changed considerably since the Ottomans first began their expansion in the 15th century. Austria had risen to be one of the great powers of the West. The feudal kingdoms of Europe had become empires in their own right, and all the while, the Turks had begun to crumble under the weight of empire. The Ottoman Empire might have looked impressive on a map at the end of the 17th century, but there were cracks in its facade, and the beginning of the Ottomans' long slide into being the sick man of Europe began on the fields around Vienna on those fateful days in early September 1683. Border skirmishes between Habsburg forces and the Turks along the Hungarian and Slovakian frontiers served as cause enough for the Ottoman Sultan to declare war in early August 1682. The Ottoman army, numbering some 150,000, laid siege to Vienna on July 14th. Kara Mustafa, their commander, had sent a demand that the city surrender, but the earlier surrender and subsequent slaughter at Perktoldsdorf galvanized the Viennese against the Turks. 15,000 soldiers, 8,700 volunteers, and 370 cannons settled in for a long siege and awaited the coming relief force. And who was leading that force but the big mustachioed badass king of Poland, Jan III Sobieski, and he was coming to do it to him. The Poles and many Catholic German states prepared a relief force to break the Ottoman siege, all of Central Europe's crown heads knew what an Ottoman capture of Vienna would mean. That was nothing less than the replacement of the church bells ringing out on Sunday with the call to prayer echoing out on Fridays. In short, nothing less than their whole way of life. But it would take time before the relief army arrived. The saving grace for the Viennese was that the Ottomans had only brought 149 cannons to the party. That was less than half of what the Austrians had. They also didn't pack enough powder. Still, you don't need guns to take a city. They'd been doing it that way for thousands of years. The Ottomans had more than enough men to cut Vienna off completely. The defenders would only hold out as long as the food stores did, and given the size of early modern Vienna, that wasn't going to be very long. By August, the city and her defenders were exhausted. Many suffered from extreme fatigue. Things improved slightly when Imperial forces won a skirmish to the north of the city. But the news that the Holy League, led by the Polish army and the bulk of the relief force, crossed the Danube on September 6th, bolstered the faltering morale of the Viennese. But, as they often do, things immediately got worse again when 5,000 Ottoman sappers broke through the city's outer defenses and the Viennese had to muster whatever they had left to defend the inner city. Then at long last, Jan III arrived at the head of the Holy League, an allied army of Germans and Poles 80,000 strong. Among them were the legendary winged Tsars, one of the finest cavalry units in history, and the coolest thing to come out of Poland since Pierogi and the Witcher. Each man wore heavy armor and came equipped with saber and lance. Strapped to their saddles, or sometimes the backs of their armor, 
were enormous metal or sometimes feather wings that made an awful noise as the men galloped onward, 17th century psychological warfare at its finest. But they would remain hidden for the time being. Jan III didn't want to reveal his hand too soon. No, first he had to move the Ottomans where he wanted them so he could use his cavalry to maximum effect. The Turks struck first. Mustafa Pasha sent men to disrupt the deployment of the Holy League's infantry. Charles of Lorraine led his German troops to victory in several skirmishes on the Ottomans' left flank. The Germans dealt some heavy blows to the Turks and seized the fortified towns of Neustorf and Heiligenstadt. The next stage of the battle began when the Polish infantry pressed on the Ottomans' right flank and took the town of Gerstov. The combined assault had cut the Ottomans off from any avenues of retreat. The besieger was now the besieged. To the relief of the Ottomans, the Polish attack ceased, only for the Germans to launch a new offensive from the left, pushing the Turks back even farther. Never forget, though, things can always get worse. As the Germans advanced, the Polish cavalry took the field, emerging from the woods to the north of the city to the cheers of the waiting infantry and the city's remaining defenders. Jan III rode at the head of the 18,000-man force with his 3,000 winged hussars. They drove back the Turkish center, pushing them into a worse position at their secondary camp. Once he had them right where he wanted them, Jan III launched his final attack. At the king's order, all 18,000 horsemen charged down the hills in the largest cavalry charge in history, breaking the record Alexander the Great had held for nearly 2,000 years since his victory at Gagamela. The Polish cavalry smashed into the Turks with incredible force. Thousands of Ottoman soldiers were killed in the initial attack, more when the Polish and German infantry joined in along with the defenders of Vienna. As many as 15,000 Turks were slain and another 10,000 captured to just 4,500 Holy League troops lost. The routed Ottoman survivors retreated back to Constantinople, tails between their legs. Sobieski wrote the Pope, proclaiming the Catholic victory, and paraphrased Julius Caesar, saying, Veminus vidimus Deus vicit, or in English, we came, we saw, God conquered. For his efforts, King Jan III was named Defender of the Faith. Never again would the Ottomans attack Vienna. 1683, in many ways, marked the beginning of Ottoman decline. The empire began to recede as the 17th century became the 18th. Put less delicately, Jan III dabbed so hard on the Turks, their empire started crumbling. Vienna was the battle that kicked off the decline of an empire and the rise of several others. As the Ottomans lost their grip on the Balkans, the Austrians and Polish took advantage, gobbling up chunks of the Turkish Empire in Europe. And it all started when the winged Tsars arrived, charging down the mountainside. That's all for me. This is Renegade Historian signing off. Have a wonderful evening, everybody.